Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we would love to connect. So on Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly. It will be recorded and shared with you afterwards. Okay, once again, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I will be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state and your organization. Be sure when responding to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. We will dedicate the last portion of the conversation to respond to the questions you post. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed on Friday to all who registered. And we are also live streaming this session on our Facebook page. Finally, we'll be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during Q&A and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Finally, before we start, I would just like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar including sessions in this regular 3 p.m. Eastern time time slot and in the earlier 1230 time slot as well. Next week, we will have an exciting double header with a peer exchange exploring how GLR communities are working to ensure digital access for all children in the 1230 time slot and a session co-sponsored by New America exploring what is behind the 10% drop in kindergarten enrollment nationwide and how district leaders are responding. We will kick off October with a special funder to funder conversation that acknowledges the emotional trauma and daunting challenges of the many layer disasters affecting communities across the country in the 1230 time slot. And later that day at 3 p.m., we will have a session in partnership with Education Week and the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, lifting up the foundational nature of trauma enforced informed practices in the construction of the deep reading brain at 3 p.m on October 5th. Registration links for these upcoming sessions will be posted in the chat box. Joining you now is John Gompertz, Executive Fellow with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thanks as always, Sierra. Um, we are so lucky to have you uh, masterminding all of these, uh, these sessions. So thanks for that. And thanks uh, especially to Emily Samos who helped put this all together today uh, and who will join us later to help with questions from the audience. And we hope there are many of those. This is a great uh, session as far as I'm concerned. It's one of my favorite topics. We have fantastic people and I'm looking forward to a really rich conversation among our guests today. As you know, through a series of conversations this year, we've heard a whole lot about the importance of relationships in early childhood learning and development. We heard from Pam Cantor, from Linda Darling-Hammond, from Ray Saldana, and from many others about this centrality of relationships. And at the campaign, we couldn't agree more about that. Um, that's why today we're gonna to take a deeper dive into what this actually means. What does the centrality of relationships mean, especially for younger children? How does it play out in various programs? And how does it interact with other campaign priorities, like the role of parent engagement and the parent-teacher dyad? Here's what, with the help of our guests, we want to explore and accomplish today. We want to deepen our understanding of the importance of relationships in early learning and development. We want to learn about the shared beliefs of those who lead efforts in the areas of coaching, tutoring, and mentoring, and also about the particular benefits of each of those approaches. And then we want to explore how these additional, extra, I don't know exactly what word you want to use, adult relationships can support and strengthen 
parent engagement, um, parent educator connections, and especially the, this, this crucial connection between parents and teachers. So that's our agenda today. And we couldn't have better folks to help us explore these issues um, than four colleagues who are joining us today. So um, I'm gonna ask folks to, in a moment, put on their, well, first we're gonna do this whole thing with the screen and then we're gonna ask people to join us. So um, Janet Carter is the president and CEO of Coaching Core. Gina martinez Ketty is the executive director of the Parent Teacher Home Visits. Um, by the way, you can find more extensive. These people have long and impressive records, and there is nothing more tedious than reading people's long and impressive records, so I'm not going to do that, but they are uh, available to you as a resource in the chat box, and were sent out earlier. And then we have David uh, Shapiro, from, who's the CEO of Mentor, and Adiola sometimes you'll hear her referred to as Ola Whitney, who is the CEO of Reading Partners, one of the nation's greatest tutoring programs. Thank you all for being with us today, and I hope you will all turn on your screens and join us live now. You'll see some nice backgrounds also. We've all been discussing each other's backgrounds, including David's garage door. Yes. So we have a terrific crowd today, and I'm eager to dig in on these key issues um, and questions and others that you all raise to each other. And then um, I also wanna to get to questions from the audience, of course. Uh, just a quick note for everyone. I'm gonna, Gina, I'm gonna come to you after I spend some time laying down some fundamentals with Janet and David and, and Ola. Uh, and then I wanna bring you into the conversation specifically to talk about how these additional or extra adult relationships uh, affect the, and can support parent uh, engagement and especially that key relationship with teachers. Um, so I'll be back to you shortly, patience. Um, let's, I, I'd like to start with this question, just the fundamentals of the importance of relationships in early childhood development and learning. Um, I think sometimes when we think about this this thing of relationships. And when we think about the specific activities that you all are involved in, mentoring, tutoring, coaching, uh, perhaps the mental picture is of kids that are somewhat older. Um, and, you know, for the campaign, obviously we care about older kids, but obviously we're focused on kids who are, you know, pre-K through third grade and their learning and development, their academic success, but also their overall developmental success. Um, and I know that each of you are sort of, while that may be the public perception of this relationship category, each of you are, are really interested in the early childhood part as well. So Janet, uh, why don't I start with you? Um, why relationships and how does Coaching core? go about introducing positive developmental relationships into the lives specifically of younger children? Well, thanks so much, John. And I, I wanna start by thanking the campaign for grade level reading for challenging us to find new answers to John's uh, question and how to create supportive network of adults around young learners and for stimulating our imagination on how we can encourage all adults, but in particular coaches, tutors, and mentors today to be what we at Coaching Corps call game changers for kids. Uh, our approach um, is, is based on the fact that we believe that there's really nothing more powerful in a relationship with a young person than communicating, I believe in you, I see your strengths, I'm here for you. And letting them know that in small and big ways every day so that they experience trust, belonging, autonomy, and growth within that relationship with the adult. And our approach is based on harnessing this power of sports and trained coaches to do just that. So we have a, a one a 30 second video we'd like to share with you, which actually, um, Sierra, if I could um, ask you to uh, play the video, it is of the voice of the people who matter the most here, the kids. Dear coach, I don't need you to be good at throwing a spiral. Scoring a goal. Or hitting a three pointer. I need you to be good at just being there so I can feel supported. And that I matter. Being there, so I can have someone to look up to who knows what it's like 
to be me. And while I'll like to be a good athlete, I'd love to be a great person. So coach, I'm asking, will you be ready to be there for me? Oof, that's that's good. That's good. You win. Well, it's 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 really it's really that's what we're all here for, right? And the way that coaching core quickly does that is um we recruit people to become sports coaches. We train them in how to create the transformative relationships that those kids are asking for. And then we place them in after school programs serving low-income communities because kids in, in low-income communities play sports at half the rate of other communities and we have a portal where you can sign up to be a coach and get trained and find a placement um, and I'll just end with saying that the best testament to John's uh, question is um, to the power of sports to be able to accelerate learning and social emotional skills is the amount of money that parents who can afford it spend and time on making sure their kids get to play sports it's not because they want them to be the next Steph Curry. It's because they know how important that relationship with the coach is. Um, and so um, it's the game-changing relationships with long, young learners that um, is, is what our coaches are all about. Well, as a Warriors fan, I'm just going to say there is no next Steph Curry. But otherwise, I subscribe to everything that you just said. Um, that's fantastic. Ola, I, I'm going to... I'm going to come to you now because what Janet said had all to do with building this sort of environment of support for young people, which puts them in a position to learn. Here you are with Reading Core, Reading Partners, a, a, um, an explicit, you know, your, your door into the relationship is actually this academic support. So mm -hmm. I'm really curious to know how you all think about the relationship part of the tutoring activity. Yeah, um, John, it's so good to see you again. David, Gina, Janet, um, I'm just honored to be on this virtual stage with you. And of course, thanks to um, Ralph and Emily and all the folks at Campaign for Grade Level Reading for inviting us to have this conversation. Um, I, you know, for those who aren't familiar with what we do at Reading Partners, I'll just say we recruit, train, support, we mobilize is the best word I think to, that can describe what we do. Um, community volunteers who tutor students one on one um, in their children elementary age who are struggling in reading. Um, and so that's kind of the cornerstone behind what we do. But to your question, John, around relationships is a great one. It, it is the cornerstone of our approach. I think first and foremost, we believe similar to what you were saying, Janet, that building a trusting relationship with a student, whether you are teaching them to read or you're working with them, you're coaching um, them in a particular sport, it's, just, it's vital. Um, the, way, the reason that we're able to really help children make significant and measurable progress in reading is because we recognize that the connection is so critical. Um, if a student connects, and trust their tutor, um, then we're really able to help them make progress. And we really focus on social and emotional learning and time. We invest the time to really build that connection. And so even in a virtual space, um, Reading Partners Connects, which um, Emily just, I think, put a link or um, puts, um, put in the chat, um, is our virtual online curriculum that we had to create during COVID last year when we were all forced to figure out how to support kids um, and not be able to be in person with them. And even in a virtual environment, social and emotional learning is critical. Even in a virtual environment, all of the things, Janet, that you said of making children feel like they are amazing, recognizing the, the inherent greatness that is them, um, building their confidence, um, you know, shit, just all of those things are so critical. And so in our tutoring curriculum, aside from it being an individualized program for every child, we infuse social and emo emotional uh, learning lessons into every session. So to really just ensure that in addition to teaching a child about phonics or letter recognition or comprehension or decoding, that we take the time to just connect with them uh, because that's really where the magic happens. That's where it starts. And that's what they remember. And then in addition to that connection between the tutor and the student, 
Uh, what also is so, so vital is a connection with their families. I truly believe um, when we talk about relationships, and it's, uh, certainly when we're talking about nonprofits and, and organizations such as Reading Partners, that's a national nonprofit, we do not do this work to a community or for a community, but rather with a community. And to really do it with a community, you have to engage families. You have to understand what parents want for their children, parents and other families that are supporting students. And that's what we really try and focus on doing through parent engagement um, and really ensuring that we shape our program and our offerings and the resources based on what our families are telling us they want, not us sitting in an office thinking that we know what they want. So I just think that that's been critical and we've had a, a, a nuanced view into the homes of our families in ways that we never had before because of COVID. And we are taking advantage of that by really ensuring that we engage with families and build relationships with the families of our students to better support them. Um, and I think that, that has been, that's been a gift that keeps on giving. Um, and then of course, closely working with our school communities, um, the school partners, the teachers, the district leaders, the principals, the folks that ultimately are responsible for bringing us into the schools um, and communicating with them, making sure that our approach is holistic and it's integrated into the school. So it doesn't just feel like yet another program, another thing that a student has to do, but rather that it's really an integrated part of their learning. That's great, Ola, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, David, you're a lot younger than I am, but you've spent a good part of your lifetime really thinking about relationships and the role that relationships play in, in young people's development. I know you've been deeply involved yourself. So I'd, I'd just love to, I, I think it would be useful for everybody to hear your take on the role of relationships bouncing off of what Janet and, and Ola said, and then then talk about mentoring after that, but you know, just stay on the big issue to start with. Give us some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you to you, to Ralph, campaign, Emily, Sierra, panelists, and then most of all to the people on the webinar. We always say in mentoring, you sort of express your values with your time and they're spending 90 minutes with us. So that's all I need to know about their values. So thank you for, for the couple hundred folks on here. Um, John, I think, I mean, I think there's a couple of interesting things. I thought about this fact that I've heard this come up a couple of times that, you know, people say, well, you know, all the other, you know, learning, learning Tuesdays, relationships just keep coming up over and over again. And that's, that's what I, that's the familiar refrain. I, I hear it's a dangling sentence, which is, Hey, mentoring guy, then why aren't they happening more? You know, I think, <laughs> or at least that's what keeps me up at night. Um, and so I, I think here's the thing. I think, um, we assume relationships happen more than they do, adults do, whenever you measure kids and adults' perceptions of quality relationships. Um, we, to Janet's point, there's a certain set of humans that buy relationships for their kids. They don't quite want to admit that, but when you spend money on enrichment for your kids, you're hoping for a relationship as well as a spark passion. And we don't like admitting that, that resource, financial resources might be analogous to relationships, not love, not care, not commitment, but the resources to get your kid engaged in enrichment. And then thirdly, I think when they're not paid attention to intentionally, <laughs> they tend to fall by the wayside. We're Americans. We like stuff and things. We build buildings. We buy curriculum. There's a capitalistic thing that makes us invest in stuff more than we invest in humans. It's just kind of the deal. Um, relationships are left to chance in a lot of the parts of our lives. And you are left to navigate them, figure out how to be a mentor magnet. I always say this, the wisdom of an 11 year old man has never left me, which is a young man named Keontae, who I'm still friends with to this day and who teaches me more about life than most people who's 25 now, said to me when he was 11, I never do anything bad enough or good enough to gain an, adult, an adult's attention. And when you think about like most of our systems, our families, the way we respond to kids. It's like, you're good enough or bad enough to gain my attention. Like, it's just the way it kind of is orchestrated. And we call home when stuff's bad or stuff's good. <laughs> like, it's just a lot. So I think, John, the question is, uh, how do we create the rigor, the intentionality, the equal proportional focus on relationship that we do on stuff, on achievement, on the things we buy, 
on the buildings, on the physical structures. How do we honor that with intentionality? How do we honor the voices of our young people who anytime you ask them say what the young people in Janet's video and coaching course video said is like, I'm taking measure of who's showing up no matter what. It's pretty much the main thing I'm taking measure of. There ain't much else I'm taking measure of. And so I think that's mainly what I notice. I always say like, no one pickets us. Like nobody's anti-mentoring or anti-relationship. Our biggest sort of, you know, opponent, I guess, is inertia or just a, a sort of taken for granted a lack of urgency. Now, COVID, I think, has created more urgency um, to sort of, you know, segue into mentoring a little bit as, as Ola talked about. I think, you know, one of the interesting things that it's, it, I, I struggle with the fact that it's, it's sort of a name of this series is this phrase learning loss. <laughs> like we're blaming kids for something they lost, which has nothing to do with them. Like there was a pandemic, like no one's telling John Gomper, it's like, man, you haven't been very productive the last six months. Be more productive, man. Like we don't do this to adults around the pandemic. We shouldn't do it to kids. Like they, there was an interruption, a disruption, which many of them, unfortunately, before the pandemic had to overcome in their daily lives to learn and thrive and strive. But our job, is to try to help them navigate the interruption to be whole and to strive and thrive. And so what we've done, to your point, John, about sort of what we can do at our best, which these folks are doing, and there's so many people, as I looked, are so inspired by seeing people's introductions, so many people from the mentoring field and the education field and the funder field, is that if we stop pitting the instrumental against the developmental, which is like, you're either tutoring or you're mentoring. You're either learning or you're doing socio-emotional and figure out that you can't do one without the other will be a lot better off. And there are tons of organizations that demonstrate that. It's not that this is not demonstrated by organizations. There are even organizations that demonstrate what Ola also spoke to, which is the sort of mentor or coach, tutor, parent, school triad you know, like instead of the dyad, the triad. But we have to bake that into systems. And something that Mentor has worked a lot on is sort of this idea of relationship-centered schools. How do we design schools as places that prioritize relationships as number one? And by the way, we know that's harder than heck. I yeah. just want to be clear about yeah. that. Like, yeah. that's right. not what these places were engineered for. They are not staffed that way. We probably have a generational opportunity here economically in terms of investment and in mentoring to harness all the programs, tools, and design innovations in our midst to make them relationship-centered centered places. But if it was easy, we'd be done. And it's really hard to center relationships in, in systems because we center around things. So let's, let me uh, pick up on something you said, David. You said a lot. Um, last 18 months, we're not exactly like any previous 18 months in our lives. And I'm curious how each of you think about the role of relationships. Here we sit in this moment that is some mix of uncertainty, hope, and worry, right? And if we're feeling that, let's assume that young people are feeling that too, even if they might not articulate it or play it out in the same way that we would. So how do you think about the role of relationships right now as we attempt to, you know, in fits and starts, reemerge, re-engage, and, and as the campaign says, try to accelerate learning so that um, whatever interruption and disruption occurred is made up for and maybe we even you know speed past where we we would have otherwise been. Ola, I'm curious, let's let's start with you on this question of of why relationships are especially critical in this moment. I think positive relationships are especially critical, not any relationship. I mean let's just call a thing a thing. I want to make the implicit explicit. Um, because as adults, we all have relationships um, and not all of our relationships are positive ones. So I think what's key is our positive relationships yep. that center students in their potential and their greatness and that are asset-based and that are not focused on all the things that they are not, 
or that they did not accomplish. And so that, that to me is key because what isn't are all of those other things that I described, which, are, which is also happening in various parts of our country, right? I mean, in, in districts and in homes and in so many different places. So I think, yes, positive relationships are really key right now um, that, that really do more to ultimately um, support our kids and mm -hmm. show their greatness and, and all of those things that I just, that I just said. That's, yeah, that's what I would add. I'm, I'm curious. Right. Um, yeah, Janet. I'm, cur folks would say. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, Janet, how this is playing out in the in the world of youth sports. Um, a uh, let's say less required activity, but you know, probably what kids are more they're more interested in. Most kids are more interested in sports and games and fun than they are in school and so forth. So, um, how how does how do you see the role of coaching right now? importance, its importance in helping us all reemerge. Yeah, um, you know, I think that the kids coming back have gone through so much and, and, and a coach can't, can't guess or know what they've gone through. So what we are finding is it's really important to equip our coaches with the tools to be able to coach through a lens of empathy. And what we mean by that is have the tools to understand the the young person's perspective, to align with that perspective, to not, um, not to make judgments about what they think the, the kids have gone through um, because of COVID. And, you know, it was funny because we started out uh, coaching or teaching our coaches uh, specifically how to foster social emotional learning skills like persistence, optimism, self-regulation, empathy, and we taught them youth development. And, um, and we realized when we did that, empath uh, the, the, the social emotional learning um, training, that actually empathy was the core foundational skill that you had to have to create any uh, relationship with a young person, a positive relationship. And what, then what we realized, it wasn't the kids that needed to be trained with empathy, it was the coaches. <laughs> and so um, we, we created a coach training, which I want to invite anyone to take. It's free. Um, there'll be a link that will to it will be um, shared here. And, and basically what it does is, is helps any adult, but in this case, coaches be able to um, do what I just said. Uh, you know, in fact, one, it was so funny. I was asking Sue Sellett, one of our master trainers who um, probably taught me everything I know to give me an example of how a coach would, would not um, make an assumption um, about what, what the kids were doing or saying. And she said, well, when a coach hears from a young person, my, my dog ate my homework. If the coach is prioritizing that relationship at that point, they don't doubt the kid. They instead say something like, well, where, where can you put your homework the next time so the co dog doesn't get it? So, you know, it's this, it's training adults, in this case, coaches, um, how to do that, how to be the person who believes in you. So I think that's more than important, most important right now because of what the kids have come through through um, in the last 18 months. So I want to ask each of you, you know, in the, in the world of tutoring, in the world of coaching, in the world of mentoring, how the pandemic has affected um, ability to recruit, to deploy, and to engage. I mean, if we're talking about younger children, um, we are for at least a couple of mornings talking about people who are not vaccinated. Um, so parents could be concerned about those kids being exposed to extra adults and extra adults could be concerned about being exposed to kids who are probably going to school and so forth. So I'm curious whether you all have experienced setbacks in this, you know, we just described this as a particularly important moment. And I'm, I'm curious and concerned that you may have experienced setbacks in recruiting and deployment. Uh, David, you want to talk a little bit about what you what you see across your network? Yeah, I mean, for those of you that don't know, mentor sort of functions a little bit like the campaign for grade level reading in terms of doing the training and advocacy and influence work for the field and movement and just trying to be good servant, servant leaders to the magicians that are in the mentoring movement. Um, 
So, you know, uh, to answer John's question, I would answer at a writ large level. John, I, I would tell you what we have seen is incredible reliance on the mentoring infrastructure that exists in communities. Like in order to meet the laptop and Wi-Fi and food needs, we saw unbelievable reliance because, you know, schools, again, because of the way they're equipped, there was this phrase that they lost young people. I'm not sure they lost young people. That was a bad, bad phraseology by that study. Young people had other priorities. Families had other priorities. Families had traumas. Things happened. Mentors and mentoring programs could typically find young people. They knew the whole prism of their lives. And so in some ways, there was a greater demand on the mentoring infrastructure, which is weaving together a community to sort of meet the whole needs of young people. Sometimes volunteers couldn't show up more. So staff was, that's the importance of staff standing behind volunteers for the training reasons that Ola and Janet spoke to and the match support needs. But also in this case, because volunteers at the outside of the pandemic were dealing with their own issues. And then I think you've had this great groundswell to find virtual meaning, to find, can I make connections virtually? Can I contribute in some way virtually? Because an empathy gap was closing around like, I see young people in my old house, in my own house, feeling lost and disconnected. I want to be there for them, but I also want to be there for other people. So I've seen, I mean, I think there are definitely some challenges. Like you said, there are still districts that, you know, aren't letting volunteers in the building and various things like that. There's also been an explosion of virtual sort of volunteerism coming in. And I think there's a real effort to be there for young people. We sort of launched this thing with some others around ready, set campaign, which was just to invite people to be part of the school support network. We also wanted to change the debate from this one about like, you know, is it the teacher's fault? Is it the kid's fault? Should the district be open? Should it be closed? Like we were having all the wrong debates that to use all those words before were not centered on students at all, really. <laughs> um, and so we're just trying to call people to young people and to schools and to the job at hand, which is harder than it's ever been. Ola, how's, how's recruiting deployment going for, for reading partners right now? Yeah, so we, we're an organization of just a little over 500 people, including AmeriCorps members, over 350 AmeriCorps members this year, and the rest are staff. And then in addition to that, um, we'll have close to 11 or 12,000 volunteers, volunteer tutors this year. And while Tutor recruitment isn't as cha challenging. AmeriCorps, uh, recruiting AmeriCorps members is difficult. And we are competing with the Targets and the Walmarts of the world that are giving great incentives to young um, folks who are you know, deciding what they wanna do as their first or second or third job out of college or between schools. So yeah. um, that has been a challenge for us. I think when the pandemic first started, um, the concern of many of our volunteers who were used to going into schools in the middle of the day because they're, you know, they were on lunch from work or um, they no longer worked or they were in a high school and they were able to take time off was erupted and, and or disrupted rather. And um, when we pivoted to an online curriculum that allowed our uh, tutors to be able to continue to support students. So um, David, you talked a little bit about that, that rise of like the virtual support. And I think we definitely saw that. So our issue wasn't, we didn't have enough tutors. Our issue now is just that we need more AmeriCorps members. Um, but because we provided a lot of training and ongoing support, uh, to our tutors um, to be able to take the bricks and mortar model and how to adapt that virtually. Um, we were, we, you know, we had a great number of uh, folks turn out to continue to support us. Terrific. And, and mainly support our students. Terrific. Uh, Janet, briefly, I, I'm Gina, I'm coming to you in one second. So get ready, put on your running shoes. Um, how's recruiting and deployment going for sports coaches right now? Well, in, in the beginning of COVID, our, our coaches went out and um, just did what the communities needed, whether it was pass out food um, at the free or reduced lunch sites. So recruiting wasn't an, an issue, even though COVID was in at its height at that point, because people, it, they, we can still do things outside um, and sports mm. is outside and, um, and and the, the, the volunteers were um, willing to go and do whatever it took. Now it's, it's harder to recruit people, um, but I think that um, because sports is outside, um, we're gonna see a, 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 an upturn in that. 
soon. Great. Well, listening to you, like I want to sign up to be a volunteer in every one of your guys' programs. I'm so charged up. Um, all right, Gina, thank you for your patience as we laid down some of those tracks. Um, and now I want to bring you in and then have everybody really join in this conversation. So I suspect, I don't know for certain, but I suspect that you are generally quite enthusiastic about what Ola and Janet and David talked about in terms of being able to add more supports for young people. But I, I also suspect you have some thoughts about how those relationships intersect with relationships that parents have with their own children and that, that, that relationship that we really want to build between um, parents and educators. So um, curious, I'm, I'm just going to start with you a, a, you know, a big broad question about uh, these additional supports and, and how that intersects with parents. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you, everybody. I have been so inspired so far. I've been taking notes and um, I am so excited about what I'm hearing, um, both from the panelists and what I'm seeing coming through in the chat box. So thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. Um, for those of you that might not know Parent Teacher Home Visits, um, we are um, all about building relationships of trust between families and educators. And we do that by providing training to educators on how to implement our unique model of relationship building home visits. And I do want to emphasize that really the sole purpose of our home visits is to build relationships of trust. They're not um, punitive visits. They're not um, triggered by, um, you know, attendance issues. They're not truancy visits. They're not wellness checks. They are about building relationships of trust between that family and those educators. Um, what we have seen, so just, just quickly before I ask, actually answer your question, that's John. That's fine, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so um, what, what we have seen is, um, and, and this is kind of agreeing with what the other panelists have already said, is just that that foundation of relationship is so important for, I, I always say that if you have that strong foundation of relationship in a school, everything else is probably going to work a whole lot better. Um, because it, it, it is the foundation for everything else. Um, we've seen um, student outcomes based on these relationship um, home visits um, in terms of decreasing chronic absenteeism, increasing ELA proficiency. But more than that, we've seen that students become more engaged in school. They're more motivated because their teachers came to visit them in their home. And that's a really special thing. Um, we've also seen, though, outcomes for uh, families and educators themselves. And so um, families, they come to see schools and educators in a totally different way. Their mindset shifts about what school is about and their relationship with school. They are more confident um, in approaching schools. Uh, they, they communicate much more often with schools. They get involved in schools. They know what kind of questions to ask. Um, and then for educators too, we see that oftentimes they are gaining valuable information from those home visits that mm -hmm. they can then take back yeah, into sure. the classroom, right? Um, so it makes them better teachers. I will also say, and somebody mentioned this before about, you know, um, kind of the teacher shortages. We hear so often from educators who are doing home visits that it reminds them why they got into the profession. Uh, and so it really is kind of a motivate, motivating force for educators as well. Um, I do want to say that when we provide our training to educators on how to use our model of home visits, that we view, we define the word educator as pretty much any adult who has a professional role at the school. Um, so it's, it's definitely classroom teachers, and we always want to make sure there's a classroom teacher going on a home visit, but it also includes office staff, it includes um, administration, it includes school social workers, custodians, and I think it's a fantastic idea to include tutors and coaches and, you know, mentors at the school who might be interacting with children in, in a different way um, outside of school or during school. And so I just imagine that, um, you know, 
you know, I, I think that what we see in home visits is that students experience um, kind of that additional motivation, not only because they have this, they know that their teachers care about them, they see that that care happening, but it's also because they see their family and their educators connecting in a new way. And so imagine if we can have their coaches and their tutors and their mentors connecting as well. It just, it builds that strong fabric of relationship around students. And they know that they have this group of adults who care about them in a whole different way. Um, and so I, I think that there's a great opportunity for, um, you know, you know I, I imagine um, the, the mentors and the coaches and the, and the tutors um, somehow connecting either with the home visit or some other way to connect with, um, with classroom educators and with families um, so that they can all share that valuable information and, um, and leverage each other's knowledge and, um, and uh, relationships with one another. So, so let, me, let me be a little possibly incorrect or provocative, I fear sometimes that the programs that we all love so much that offer additional support are, are sometimes not seen as additional support, but kind of like replacement for parents who are, for whatever reason, not able to fully play their role. And, and that is um, I think that that sort of idea exists out there, that that's what mentoring is actually about. I don't think that the people in the mentoring, tutoring or coaching field think that, but I think others think that. And I worry sometimes that parents can feel threatened by others who are engaging with their kids. It can feel disempowering. So uh, first, I'm curious, um, really, Gina, for your thoughts on that. And then I, I'd like to hear from the program perspective, how, how people are prepared to deal with parents who've got struggles of their own, and sometimes aren't able to show up in every way that they would love to show up. Yeah, I think you make an excellent point, John, is that parents care about their children. I, I have never, I, now I haven't met every parent in the universe, right? But uh, I have never met a parent that does not care about their children. Um, and so that is just the flat out assumption that we have to start with. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think parent, a lot of parents have had histories with the education system um, that have not been very positive. And so, um, so it's no wonder that they don't want to get engaged because there's been a long history in a lot of communities of schools and educators and programs playing a certain role vis-a-vis -vis the family and certain assumptions about what the family is doing or not doing. And I think it's really important to address those assumptions that we're placing on each other. Um, and so, um, so schools are, are placing assumptions on parents about how much they care or don't care. Parents themselves are assuming things because of their own experience in school. And so there's got to be a way for, um, to begin to disrupt those kind of assumptions. And, and we think home visits is one way to do that. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, I think- okay. Interesting. So Janet, I, I want to come to you first and then and then to Ola about this. There's a, there's something around sports, you know, activities that feels to what Gina just said, perhaps safer to some parents than parents who didn't have particularly good experiences with school, um, feel intimidated, disrespected in school settings, may actually feel more comfortable in in activity settings. So I wonder how you think about that. And also what's in your, you mentioned your training before. I'd like to know a little bit about how you train coaches around family engagement. 
Yeah. So um, that's a great question, John, because, you know, sports is all about creating community, right? It's a hook for parents, it's a hook for teachers, it's a hook for all other adults that are in the children's life. They love to come out and see the kids play. So I think coaching and sports gives us a moment that we should use more effectively together as a place where uh, this communication can happen, this intentionality that David talked about could happen. Um, we don't have to figure out a different platform that that half of the people aren't going to be able to access. <laughs> we could just possibly center it on a place where parents, like you said, feel like they they want to come and they and they often do. So I, I think that's really important. I, I think to your second question, um, you know, this this uh, the campaign for grade level readings um, sort of leadership and bringing this <laughs> this uh, topic up has made us think about our work differently, and we realize we don't equip coaches. Um, with enough tools to make sure they're intentionally engaging uh, parents. The parents do show up and, um, and, it, and, and we need to, you know, we've learned from our coaches what those best practices could be. For example, you know, take the opportunity to talk to the parent to find out what's going on with the young person. Talk to the teachers. The teachers often show up or the coach is going into the school, uh, you know, to find out what's going on with the with the young person. Um, virtuality, if you will, can I make up a word, has made that easier. Um, you know, and we've got some coaches who know that the parents are working three jobs because we work in low income communities. So they, um, and they can't come to sports. So they've moved the games to weekends intentionally so that the, the parents will come. Um, and, and then there's that whole thing, you know, the the relationship between the coach and the parents. Um, you know, sometimes when a parent says, I'd like to talk to the coach, the coach is like, oh no, I didn't give the kid enough play time. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what can we do to equip um, uh, coaches with um, a way to see that as a positive moment, right? All those things I wish I could say we do, we don't. And I think after this webinar, we're gonna think about doing it. Love that, love that. Ola, I think that sometimes um, tutors can mm -hmm. be experienced as extensions of school. The, the mm -hmm. focus is academic or people can perceive that the focus is academic. And then you can run into that loop that Gina was talking ab about with parents who, who didn't really prosper in school. That wasn't their thing. They had a lot of other things going on. And so they feel intimidated. They don't feel like masters. They don't feel a high sense of efficacy. So I'm curious how you prepare your, um, your tutors to mm -hmm. engage with the parents and try to create that positive connection and energy. Yes, I think that's a great question. I would say first and foremost, I mean, admittedly, and Janet, I appreciate what you said. We have not, we certainly haven't figured it all out at Reading Partners. I think we are better off now than we were years ago, but um, because of COVID, just to be really clear, and because we were forced to work with our students virtually, it created an opportunity for us to really look ourselves in the mirror and say, we're not doing this work with our communities in the way we strive to. And in order for us to do that, we have to build relationships with our families. So John, I think first and foremost, it starts with our staff mm -hmm. and how we build those relationships. And we cannot train our tutors to do so if we're not doing so. So that's where we first start. And I mean, we, we just asked, we first made some assumptions of what we thought parents wanted and we realized, uh, nope, that's probably not what we should do. Why don't we just ask them? Why don't we give them a survey and provide incentives uh, for those who complete the survey and just asking them during COVID, what are the resources that they want? What are the ways that they want us to engage them? And that's what we did and it worked. Um, and, and as a result of that, that then helped to shape the training and orientation that we provided to our tutors. Far too often, and you know, it's, it's sad, but it is a true reality in this country. And I mean, we all saw both pandemics, the, the global pandemic and the racial reckoning. Sometimes people go into this work with like this savior complex or this idea, um, Gina, to your point of, if, it's not that these children need love. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not, not receiving love, right? They're not not being cared for. They are. Um, but rather, um, we are here to provide even additional support. But to, to come into, and I remember having to say to a tutor long ago, um, they, they, they were talking about the work that they were doing. And they were like, yeah, you know, I'm here to just 
provide love because I know these kids don't get that. And I said, but do you? How do you know that they don't? You don't. So, I mean, I, I think there is that. And so, um, so much of what we do, I think folks have the right intentions and don't always recognize their impact. And so a big part of our training and onboarding focus for our tutors is helping them understand what it means to be asset-based and how we think of not, oh, these poor kids and they're so this, but rather think like the fact that they learned anything during a global pandemic is incredible. And the first thing that you can say is, you, you know, you can, you can um, shower them with positive reinforcement. You can talk about that. And so how do we how do we use role playing in different scenarios in our onboarding process and training with tutors to help them understand that that's hard and then how do we do it even in real time and virtually it's a little harder to do that than in person uh, but those are some of the things that we are working on and just bringing our parents and our families of our students closer into our program to ultimately ensure that the decisions we may make about our program model are shaped by the feedback that we're hearing from families. And I think the more that we center our families into what we, as opposed to making assumptions, they don't care, it's so hard for them to do this, they don't, well, like all of the things as opposed to doing that in the same way that we ensure that we have an asset frame, you know, asset based uh, way of thinking around our students, we should do the same thing for families. And so many of us are also parents, you know? And so I, you know, I will often ask like, would you think that for your own child? Then why would you think that for somebody else? So it's just, it's important that we do that. John, I could talk about this forever. I love it. But I know we so, don't but, have I, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the mic back from you. I'm gonna give I'm, it to you. I'm Gina. passing it to you. <laughs> Uh, Gina, you have an opportunity to do live re-education and training with these people. Um, what would you say to people who, who lead programs that are really intended to provide additional support, just as Ola just said, to young people with a real uh, a positive intentionality around those young people who are struggling the most. I mean, this, everybody on this, on this screen is, is really about equity and trying to help those kids who are struggling the most and are in the most challenging circumstances. What would you say to, you got them, they're right here on your screen. What would you say to them about how to engage parents in the most positive way that will help accelerate the learning of those young people? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think um, for me, it's, it's, it's a, a change in focus, right? Rather than ask, how do we engage the parents? It's asking, what do we need to do in order to um, be in a different kind of relationship with parents? And so for us, at, when we do our training with educators, um, you know, there's a lot of um, barriers. A lot of them, quite frankly, are around fear um, about going in, into students' homes. And because of all the different mindsets that educators have about families, students, communities, all of that. And so we really try to help our educators get an understanding of what kind of mindsets they have coming into the home visit. But then um, most importantly for us, it is kind of an action reflection process. And so the experience of doing the home visit, and that's why I, I, I liked what you were saying, Ariola, about um, you know, trying to do it real time because it is the experience of something that I think provides a very ripe opportunity for them to go back and reflect on together. Like when you, for, for us in the home visit context, it's like, you know, we have teachers go out and do the home visits and then we bring them back at some point to do um, kind of a, a reflection debrief of their home visit experiences. And just really simply asking them like, how, you know, what did you think about the family or the student before you went into the home visit? And what did you learn about them? And how did you come out thinking about them differently after that experience? Um, and then, you know, most importantly, I think in some ways is not only what did you learn about the student or what did you learn about the family? What did you learn about yourself from doing that home visit and reflecting on it afterwards? I think that's a really key question to do some self-reflection on how I, as a teacher, as a mentor, as 
a coach, whatever role I play, how did I change as a result of this experience in this relationship? So, David, I see you're eager to talk. And I was just going to ask you, um, in fairness, I would say that probably Ola used the term savior. Um, the mentoring field might be, might have at one time led the league in, um, in sort of a white savior kind of uh, mindset. Um, and I know that you've worked extraordinarily, you've thought hard on this and worked extraordinarily hard on this. Curious of your thoughts and what you see, what evolution you see in the mentoring world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, I, I even think about the phraseology used a little bit ago about kids struggling the most. I, I think more reframing that around kids that are facing the most because some of them are fair. enduring yeah. and achieving at incredible levels that one many of us could not imagine based on what they're facing. Um, but I, I will never speak about mentoring as sort of like a monochromatic thing. What I will say is that the roots of the first ever mentoring program <laughs> were born 110 years ago of a guy who was sort of like taking pity on kids that were on the street that he thought didn't have a home. And it sort of was built on saving those children, you know? And so there has been a huge soul searching. I think also the nonprofit industrial complex is up against this thing where it sells itself as the urgency and dire need of a problem to solve things to funders. So humans become problems to solve. And thus we approach our work that way. Um, I still think we need to articulate the problem that we are trying to address. The work is about trying to solve for something that is not engineered right, or the system is behaving exactly the way it was supposed to, which is unfairly. So we do need problem statements and solutions. We cannot treat humans as problem statements. <laughs> and that is where often the work kind of bleeds together, John. I think in mentoring and lots of youth development and education, um, I think what I have heard loud and clear in everybody's words, and especially in Gina's most recently, is that we all need Sherpas on this journey to stay away from our implicit biases, the things we fear, the things we all have whether we're educators or mental health professionals or coaches or parents, the things we assume about the system. And so to me, the mentoring professionals that I love so much and volunteers and all the people on this call, they are the Sherpas <laughs> to try to help us bridge build, to see ourselves with an asset lens, to get past the things that keep us from getting in each other's way in a positive way. And the other people have a chance to help us invest in more human capital, to coordinate and Sherpa each other to better outcomes and more asset-based lens. And organizations, I think, are going through their own self-discovery and doing that. I see that at an energy level in the mentoring field I have never seen before. Um, I see it in terminology, like there's an organization on this call, Friends of the Children. On the one case, they could tell you how children are selected, which is a lot around things they are facing in this world. Um, that you would never hope children are facing, but those children are called achievers. Because if we can support them in the way that all young people need to be supported, they are achievers. And they are achievers from the day the organization found them and the day they were born <laughs> and the days here on after. And so, I, but, I, but we need help, man. We need Sherpas. Like we are not our own best heroes when it comes to our biases and our desire to save the day out of Taola's point earlier, good intentions, but we need people to recalibrate us. I do want to respond to one other thing, if it's okay, that's in oh. the chat, which is about um, sort of how do we get educators to do X? How do we get educators, despite all the program pressures to focus on relationships? I, at Mentor, at least we think it's two things. One, we think it's skill building. You know, my, my wife was a financial aid advisor, and this is the beauty of reading partners and coaching core, you know, she used to say, they teach me how to guide kids through a FAFSA. They don't teach me how to form a relationship with them. So they'll share all this incredible personal information with them, with people. So I think one, it's about an intentionality about relationship building, but also it's about how we build the human infrastructure around teachers so that they're not alone in forming relationships. None of us 
Like if I told you I had 27 direct reports, you would tell me that's too many. That's insane, you'd tell me. And yet a teacher has 27 direct reports, 30 maybe, 20, whatever. And so I just don't think it's fair to ask. I don't know, even if Chan Zuckerberg creates a long, like I don't think we're going to out tools this thing. It's about structuring our schools so that there's more human capital and it's interconnected. I do think we're seeing an acceleration in hiring guidance counselors and mental health professionals. I just also think to leverage at the rate that we need to leverage, we're going to have to leverage volunteers. We're going to have to leverage advocates. We're going to have to leverage mentor, paid mentors. Like I just think there's a whole field to leverage in addition to some of these other professionalized fields. Then we can create these triads and kids will be met with the supportive relationships that allow them to thrive and strive. That's the opportunity we have right now. So uh, that's the last question I have. And then I want Emily's help in, in bringing in some of the questions that I know are happening in the chat and the Q&A box. Um, we do have this extraordinary moment right now. I mean, we've struggled through uh, a miserable, in many respects, 18 months. But one of the things that's happened is that Congress has appropriated boatloads of money for local school districts and um, it's created uh, confusion, it's created challenge and it's created excitement and it's created opportunity. I think this crew right here believes that relationships should be central and we should figure out the ways to invest in relationships. I suspect many of the people who are listening right now and will listen in the future are interested in exactly that. So Ola, I'll, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Gina, but I'm, I'm just curious, like there are a lot of resources right now. People on this call, I, I'm sure are stirred up and want to do stuff. What stuff can happen right now because of the new resources? Collaboration. Collaboration is free. I don't think any of us on this screen um, are suggesting that we're the panacea. And I'm sure folks in this, um, the participants, the same, right? Like it, it truly takes a village. And I think that collaborating, I talk with other literacy folks that I've been on panels with you, um, where you've, you've moderated, John, other panels yeah. um, for the campaign with other CEO literacy um, leaders. I talk with them all the time. So I think collaboration, understanding what is working, understanding how you're challenged and not trying to do this work alone, I think is key. I think, I mean, I ask my team all the time, are you doing this work with your community to it or for it? And if the answer isn't with, or you can't give an example of how you're doing it with, I think, you know, perhaps therein lies the problem. So it is, it's free to pick up the phone or email and call someone or email someone to have a conversation about how they're returning to school. So a lot of what we did um, right before this school year started was going directly to our district and school leaders to understand how are you prioritizing the needs of your students? What does social and emotional learning look like when you go back into the school. So literacy was like the fifth or sixth question that we asked. It, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't the, the most important. And so um, we are constant in, we're in 12 different parts of this country and we're constantly finding ways in each of our various regions to work directly with local communities and other nonprofits um, to ultimately support students. Um, so this doesn't well, answer the question about the well, money I, the only, actually, and all that. The, but. the only, the only, the only I love everything you say and the spirit you bring to it. The only thing I would disagree with, yeah, and I, I think it's a it's a dangerous thing to say. Collaboration isn't free. Your time isn't free, and you don't need to work sixty hours a week because you want to call David and Janet and connect with them, and you want to get some input from Gina. Like that's your job. That's right. You should be paid for that. That's and great. sometimes, you know, David, you said people like to buy stuff and junk, and there are people who make money from selling stuff and junk. Um, but really what we need here is more human interaction. Mm -hmm. And in order to have more human interaction, you got to have more bandwidth. We just can't ask people to dig deeper. We can't say to teachers, you got to do these visits. So you're going to have to work 60 hours a week instead of 50. 
That's right. not going to sell. So Gina, I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about how additional resources might make this, the, the building of this human web of support around kids mm -hmm. more possible. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, so I was a community organizer for 18 years. And so one of the things we always said was follow the money, right? If you want to know somebody's priorities, follow the money. Um, and so I, I, yes, I think that we need to look at our schools and the you know, organizations surrounding our students and look at where is the money being spent? And you're right, John, like we cannot expect um, teachers tutors, you know, all of the people around students, we cannot expect them to do this on their own time or on their own dime, right? Um, and so one of the things, um, very concretely, part of our model of home visits, a not what we call a non-negotiable core practice, is that um, educators get paid for their home visit time. That's a non-negotiable for us. And so if we want to bring in, um, which I think is a great idea, um, the coaches and the tutors and the mentors, how do we find the funding to make sure that their time is honored by paying them for their home visit time or for their time building relationships? The other thing that I want to say is that, um, you know, like how do we make sure that relationships are like a central priority in a school? And I just want to give one small example, and this has less to do with money, but and more to do with time. But one of the big challenges that we hear from educators about doing home visits is how do I find the time? Because there's so many demands put on us. And so I always like to tell the story of one of our home visit teachers who, with the permission of her principal, said, I'm not going to give homework for three months. I'm going to take that off my plate so that I can invest in doing home visits, knowing that the relationship is going to make homework a whole lot easier when I have those relationships. And so how do we create the money and the time and so that relationships are a central priority in schools? I think that's a big, big question. Um, and yeah, so I think there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think it's important that we pay attention to it. That, that goes directly to what David was saying about the campaign he's part of to really put relationships at the center of the school world. Janet, I'm curious about you. We think about, you know, like volunteer coaches. It's all free. It's great. They're all volunteers. Nobody needs any money. This, this is wonderful. But I, I suspect that isn't actually true. So I'm curious how you think about resources. And um, if, if folks on the call want to bring the, some of that energy uh, to their communities around using sports and coaching to really um, help accelerate learning and development among young kids. What does that take? And what's the well, opportunity now? You know, I think I would encourage us all to think about, um, to find the, find the places where what we're talking about today is already happening. And, and I think that coaching and sports, there's a lot of places that that is the center of of um, these relationships between mentors and teachers and parents and coaches and um, ha are already there. Why? Because you've got a coach there or a teacher or whomever that really believes in what we're talking about now, the power of relationships. And they just inherently act that way, right? So they have created um, a way, whether it's around the school or around the sports that this is already happening. So I would encourage um, people who are thinking about how do we fund this, how do we support this, to find where it's already happening, and then to ask them what they need. How, you know, because I think the answer to how to fund this is different depending on the community. And like David and I, this morning, we just found out that we're working together. Our staff is working together in Oakland. We wouldn't have known that if it hadn't have been for this call, this uh, webinar. So, you know, I think we've got it. And before we go, okay, let's let's create the new, hottest, best thing. Let's let's stop and say, wait, it's already happening in a lot of places. How can we support it? Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I love that John knows not even to wait, wait to call on me. Um, I would just add to that to sort of sum up, you know, Gina, you talked about, you know, going where the money is. Um, and and I, I think one, one thing that I've stolen from uh, Julia Freeland Fisher, who's at the Christian, Christensen Institute, and she wrote a great book called Who You Know. I should promote her book if I'm going to steal what she says. 
Um, but she talks about, we can't sort of get over this hump to make relationship an outcome to itself. We only get jazzed up about relationship when it helps with attendance and it helps with achievement and it helps with social emotional. Like, how about just getting jazzed up about like when, you know, when parents send their kids to school, Gina talked about how much all parents love their kids. They want them to be met with relationship. They're certainly invested in achievement and, you know, doing mastery of certain things, but they want them to finish that school feeling like they have a set of adults that care about them. And so I think, John, if I were a funder right now in this moment, I mean, one, I'd be looking at things like where there is investment in tutoring core to Janet's point to say, how do I lever that for relationships as well? Not just for the content, but also how do we train these tutors? If there's going to be a massive investment in the presence of adults in the lives of kids, we need to make sure they're getting rigorous relationship training and support, one. Two, I would be trying to push the system to say, how can relationship be an outcome unto itself? How can we measure your school by whether kids say at the end, centering youth voice, Ola said, when do we actually listen to the consumer in schools? When a kid can say, I graduated this place, I moved on to middle school, whatever it was, I know there's five adults in this building that cared about me. Like, I don't know, that's a place I want to send my kid. Like that, I, I don't know what else we're looking for, really. And, but we don't ever, have you ever seen that in one of the, great city schools or US News and World Report. I never saw a relationship index on any of those school ratings. I think we need to get to where we're mapping backwards from that. Because to Gina's point, we know we'll spend money on what we're being held accountable for. And until we're being held accountable for relationships, I think they'll continue to just be this hopeful bridge. Um, and that I think this is a paradigm shifting moment. So people should be pressing on that. Philanthropy should be putting money out there on that because the system won't reorient itself. Systems don't do that. That's not what they were built to do. So and David, it's more than a nice to have is what you're saying too. Yes, yeah, absolutely. For sure, for sure. Emily, I wanna, um, I wanna bring you in because I know you've been watching the, the chat and the Q&A box. And um, I know that there's been, there've been a lot of people on and are super engaged. So I'm gonna turn to you now to pose a couple of questions from, from our audience. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because our amazing um, panel here has answered a lot of the questions, but I do think some of them are good to just sort of bring up again. And even though you've addressed a lot of these in your comments, I thought these couple of questions from Alex Kolker, and I'm going to assume that um, let's say you are a principal or you're somebody at a school and you want some really practical advice on how to better integrate families into the school student relationship. I know you've all touched on this, but like getting it down to like, Here's what you should do if you're in a school and you're trying to get, you know, your teachers more, in, um, you know, involved in that school student relationship, or you get your families more involved. And then taking that a step further, how do you get teachers who are, you know, completely overwhelmed and exhausted after the past 18 months to focus on relationship building with individual students and considering all these other stressors they have right now? Gina, do you want to start on, on the, the first question? Um, getting fa uh, families engaged, is that the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I think it comes down to uh, listening, listening to families. Um, we oftentimes um, communication between families and schools is one way. It's an invitation, hey families, come out to this or hey families, can you do this? Um, and we really don't take the time to listen to what, fam what matters to families, right? What's the best way to communicate with them? What kinds of things do they want to be communicated about? Um, how do they know that they can trust us as an institution to come and be engaged with? How do they know that we're going to pay attention to their ideas? Um, and so I think really sitting down, and, and, I, and I know it's like it's a time-consuming thing, and and. Um, you know, it's not an easy solution, but I think taking the time to sit down and listen to families about what they need is it, it, it will take you miles, miles and miles ahead of where you, you might be now. I will say that we learned a big lesson from Common Core where we assumed that we understood what people's aspirations were and didn't. And then later, 
tried to run around and rally parents to be in support of this after not asking them whether this was their idea. And that just didn't go very well. <laughs> just didn't go very well. Emily, can you restate the second question? I'm sorry. Um, really just looking for specific advice, like looking, thinking about teachers and the state that they're in right now, being kind of having multiple stressors, coming back from the 18 months, all of the stuff that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, <clears throat> what, what does it take? How do you support them in really having a, to focus on relationship building with individual students? I mean, I, for us, I think there are two things. I think there's one, it's a skill, right? So there's training. I mean, that's what there is training in, in operating with a mentoring mindset. And I think we don't, breakthrough in the chat talked about how they prepare their teaching fellows. I'm not sure as a profession, we're preparing teachers that way. So we need to augment. They have development days with relationship training and mentor offers it, search offers it, other people offer it. And then two though, and probably more importantly, but a little bit more complex, Emily, I think we need to design schools so that there are more people who are allies in the coordination of relationship building, um, like coaching core, like reading partners, like guidance counselors, I mean, you know, if we had, if guidance counselor averages weren't 420 to one, you know, <laughs> we, the teachers would have a lot more people. We should have more helping professions inside schools. So we have a thing called relationship centered schools around designing your school around putting relationships in the center. Cause we think it's a design challenge as much as it is a tool and a program challenge, even though the design is going to call for the very programs and tools that we have in our midst. To Janet's earlier point, which is that we have the infrastructure to draw on. It's who's figuring out how to draw on and coordinate that infrastructure. So that's that would at least would be my answer. I don't know what Ola and Janet, you guys want to answer that or something else. Ola, did you want to add something? Please? Um, I didn't want to add to that one. I was going to, I, I was literally just typing a response to Mona Halcom. Mona, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Mona asks a question about relationships and cultural competency and specifically asks, can we talk about relationships without mentioning cultural competency? And so I'll just say what I was typing to you, Mona. I don't, I don't think we can. Um, and further, and I don't recall, David, if this was you who said this or Gina, if it were maybe you, um, but someone earlier mentioned implicit bias and that we all have it, which is so true. And regardless of our role in education or outside of education, and um, you know, how can I think it's it's critically important for us? Like, there's such a big part of cultural competency equity work is understanding the journey that you're on first in your own identity and perhaps the privilege that you walk into a relationship with, especially um, when you're working with the populations we work with at Reading Partners and other. Um, disadvantaged populations throughout this country. And so I think first and foremost, like what I, you know, what implicit bias do you have? And is there a way either through staff training or volunteer training or what have you to help support folks who are doing work with students through that? I, I think it's critical. And I, I think it's hard to have conversations with really about relationships without focusing on that. And especially given the racial reckoning and so many people raising their hand to volunteer and support students over this last year, um, you know, doing it now and seeing the urgency, I, I think nonprofits and educators alike are just responsible uh, for helping to train and support the communities that come to volunteer with them or coach or tutor or, you know, any of the above. Janet, I see you leaning in, which is a good thing, because I was going to ask you, um, I think there's something implicit, uh, there's sort of an implicit equity play in, in what Coaching Core is trying to do. But when I listen to Ola, I think, yeah, yeah, that's great. But how do you make that much more explicit? How do you prepare your coaches um, to really be on that journey and not assume that they're just great souls because they've raised their hand for this, this assignment? Well, um, one of the ways for the specific coach is to, um, th that's what the empathy training was designed to do, to make it so that they don't 
coaches don't assume that they understand the life experience of the young person. But more importantly, um, I think we've learned a lot about that. Um, and we, we recognize that what we used to do essentially is we would say we're, we're, we're helping you community um, figure out how to increase sports access. Um, as opposed to now, what we've decided, what we're doing is asking the community to tell us how they would increase sports access. So while most communities will tell you we want sports, we want it to be equitable because we believe in the power of the relationship that coaches can bring for young people, one community has a different way of doing it than another. So we've now started what we call learning communities where we bring primarily black and brown leaders together to say, what is it that works here? What are your assets already that you wanna to employ towards this? And then what else do you need? And we're, we're seeing an incredible response to this. Why? Because everybody wants sports for their kids, right? It's not that we have to sell this. This is not a, a program we have to you know, tell people that, oh, by the way, these are our outcomes and there's a research to back up the outcomes. Everybody knows that that's what sports is. And so I think it's really important for all of us to step back and make sure we're asking, particularly black and brown communities um, and communities who don't have access to whatever it is that we're um, that we're offering, how how do you think we should do this? Really interesting, and Janet, I'm curious as a little follow up: the extent to which coaching core would do you train, prepare coaches to encourage students around uh, to young people around their student endeavor uh, around you know, showing up and tr really trying at school? Or, or is this built on really the notion that people are gonna feel respected and feel heard and seen, and therefore they're gonna feel better and therefore they're gonna do better in school? Is there something that you're doing to explicitly build that bridge between participating in sports and the possibility of greater academic achievement? Um, yes, in the sense that we, we see that the social emotional learning, um, obviously, uh, it, it supports academic achievement. And so we equip our coaches to foster social emotional skills like persistence, optimism, self-regulation, empathy. But most important and what's most relevant to us today is that the power of a person who believes in you and who gives you that experience of autonomy, growth, um, uh, trust and belonging is what makes you believe in yourself. And that's what we're really going for. I love David's uh, point about let's make relationships the outcome. I, I, I just think that is so important if we're focused on academic achievement, then that is, I mean, making relationships uh, the key, what we're going for is what is, it would be so important. It would be a mind shift. It would indeed. Emily, I'm coming back to you. Do you have uh, more that you want to you want to probe based on what people in the audience are saying? Sure. I mean, I think this is an interesting and kind of specific question. So I'd, I'd love to throw it out, especially hearing, you know, I know, Ola, you shifted up to an online system, but what are some key tools that can help to express empathy in that virtual setting? And, you know, now that there's, there's this person thinks it's an anonymous poster, um, there's, there, there's been a sort of an empathy gap that's been created because of the pandemic and being isolated. So what are some tools that can bring that into the virtual setting? Yeah, I think it was Janet who was also just talking about empathy and she has a tool. What we have is... Um, so as part of our curriculum, we have lessons that are social and emotional learning focused. So we call them SEL lessons. We have them every few lessons that a student goes through. And so it's meant to build their confidence, to take some time away from reading, to just connect with them and talk about how they're doing, to talk about things outside of the session that we're focused on. So there's there are key questions. And for that anonymous person or anyone else, email me if you're interested mm -hmm. in hearing more about that at Ayala Whitney. My name is right below my face mm -hmm. at um, readingpartners.org and I'm happy to share. And then Janet, if you wanna, maybe I pass it to you to talk a bit more about the empathy tool that you were, I think you said something about empathy tool. Yeah, we linked it okay. in the, um, 
Oh, okay, training. you did. Okay, great. the training, yep. Um, and then, oh, I was. Can I just also say just one other thing, Emily? Maybe before the next question, I think when we again to make the implicit explicit, we were talking about cultural competency. Thanks to Mona for throwing out. Um, that question about about cultural competency and relationships. And I think um, something that I believe based on what other folks have already said here today, I, I would imagine um, the other leaders on this panel believe the same thing is just that we as organizations have a responsibility to our students and our families to not cause undue harm in our approach. And so then that means in, in the training that we do, it's just, it's, it's essential for us to make training a priority for our staff or volunteers and all of those folks. So I just, I wanted to say that I kept talking about training and onboarding. I didn't get to talk specifically about what it looked like um, or how we do it within our organization, but that's also just a little bit of the why. And I think when organizations are speaking about equity and the work that they can do, it's just so much bigger than a performative statement that we can write on our website. Um, especially after a person of color is killed or there's some violent act that happened. Like it is, it's so much bigger than that. It's just also about our actions and what we do in the experience of the people, our stakeholders, our students, our families, our communities, and the staff and volunteers who are part of our organization. Thank you for letting me say that, Emily. Yes, thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Um, so shifting a little bit here, I actually really love this question from Pamela Sivens um, because we've talked a lot about the important roles. Obviously this is all about caring adults, but how do you make sure you're including youth voice in your work and your planning and implementation? And Ola, I know you responded in the, in the Q and A, um, so feel free to answer or maybe David or Janet or Gina. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that and someone else wrote in the, in the chat, a powerful statement, which I think is often said about teachers and their voices when we're talking about changing their institutions. And usually they're working so hard actually educating students. They're not involved in our webinars while we're sitting in our offices and they're actually proximate with kids. Um, but I think when we do our relationship-centered schools design work, students and teachers are the key informants. So I think the question is just like, and I think this goes to Ola's point too, because it's like, what voices are informing you? And again, like who are you viewing as problems to solve versus assets to solve? To Janet's point about the infrastructure and the ideas might already be there. And to Gina's point about how much we're all loving and committed to our children. I think these are just things we're on autopilot about, man. Or, or we, to Ola's point, we do them once, we do them in a training, <laughs> but then we don't realize that like the actual twists and turns of bias and inequity come usually in the midpoint of the relationship when we see something and respond to it and then we don't know. And so I would just ask everybody to challenge themselves. Like, who are you listening to? How proximate are they? And are you listening to them more than once? Because that's what performative, sort of what performance is all about is like, I listen to you, sick. You know, so like, how are we listening to people repeatedly? That's what poor power comes from. And so I, I think that's the answer, Emily, is like, how is it baked in? How is it a key, consistent, supported, informant of your program, young people, families, teachers, to keep shaping them. Yeah, and I, I think that um, the, the, um, if you're coaching through a lens of empathy or doing anything with a young person through a lens of empathy, that's what it is. It's what David just talked about. It's like you're, you're listening to the young person. You know, and I, I see that happen in, on fields and gyms all the time. Like one of my favorite stories was when um, one of the uh, kids told their teammates, it's not just the coach, it's the, their teammates, that his dad was getting out of um, uh, prison or, or jail and he was coming to watch the game and the young person was super scared and also excited about finally my dad gets to see me play. And the teammates figured out themselves and how to, when the father showed up, to situate so the young person could make that basket, could do all these amazing things. It wasn't just the coach listening to what that young person was going through. It was the teammates. They figured that out and the coach facilitated it. So I think the voices of young people need to be constantly in there and you can't, you can't design for that, right? The only thing you can design for is getting, making sure that people have the tools they need to do what David just said, listen and respond accordingly. 
Oh my goodness. So John, you know, we have one minute left, but I, I think I, we, should, we should have a whole nother session where you're just telling these stories because oh my goodness, <laughs> that really gets, um, but I'm just going to say my quick thank you. And then John, let you do, do our close out and talk about our upcoming webinars and everything. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, echoing Emily and and sort of the mutual love and respect across uh, across the people who are on this panel. This has been totally fantastic. We've I think generated a tremendous amount of interest, and we're going to continue to pursue these issues as we go forward. Um, we really I think we subscribe to we the campaign subscribe to everything that everybody said here about engagement, and there's just lots and lots of work to do um, in making making systems realize that relationships are key and that they're not actually add-ons or bolt-ons but they are um, at the core of what needs to happen so to to janet and adiola to david and to gina just a, a huge thank you to all of you and and thank you emily again for um facilitating the questions and answers and sierra i know you're still on there somewhere in the background you did a fantastic job so we're going to put up i think this screen with the uh upcoming learning tuesdays and uh thank you all for joining us today Thank you. Thank you all so much. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. I learned so much. I did. I did. Ola, thanks so much. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.